In section 3.3, we're going to begin modeling with systems. And by systems, we mean as opposed to an individual differential equation, we might consider the case where we have two dependent variables that could be interacting with each other, such as with competing species living in the same environment. So we're going to model these systems of differential equations um, using um, the following form. So here's a, an example of what a two um, equation system might look like. You could have uh, dx dt is equal to some function g, we'll call it g1, that depends on the dependent, sorry, the independent variable t, the dependent variable x, but let's say there's a third variable now, y, which is also dependent on t. And so we could also have a differential equation that depends on y. So dy dt is g sub 2 which depends on t, x, and y. So any solution to this system would have to satisfy both equations simultaneously. And so we're going to look at a couple of different models in 3.3 where the um, same techniques we used to set up differential equations back at the end of chapter 1 apply, but we have multiple variables involved. So let's think of the mixture problem. In the mixture problem, we had two tanks which allowed flow between them. Actually, in our original mixture problem, we only had one tank. So now we're going to consider the case that we have two tanks. So let's say we have tank here. I'm going to call this tank A. And we have another tank here. We're going to call this tank B. And they both have something coming into them. So an inflow tank and something flowing out of them. Now the A and B tank are connected to each other. So there's a flow from A to B and there's a flow back from B to A. Um, we're going to say that uh, tank A and B both contain 50 gallons when we start. And in fact, we're going to choose our inflow rate so that these volumes stay fixed. Let's say that uh, at the beginning, um, tank A has 25 pounds of salt dissolved. Tank B is filled with pure water. Um, and let's model the amount of salt, um, as it indicates here in the last sentence, the amount of salt in tanks A and B respectively as x sub 1 of t and x sub 2 of t. So this statement about what happens at the beginning would provide us with our initial conditions. We know that x1 at 0 time would be 25 pounds of salt and x2 at 0 is zero because it's filled initially with pure water. Now what we've got to do is we're going to label um, the flow into each of these tanks and out of each of these tanks. And I'm following the model of an example that is in the textbook on page 107. Let's say we've got um, three gallons per minute coming into tank A of pure water. Okay, And let's say coming out of tank B we also have three gallons per minute. But the concentration is going to depend on whatever amount of salt we have in B at a given time, T. And from A to B, we have four gallons moving per minute from tank A to tank B, and we have one gallon per minute moving from tank B back into tank A. And so if you notice, each tank has a total of four gallons per minute moving in and out of it. So for example, tank A has this three gallons per minute coming in, and one gallon per minute coming in from tank B, and together that's four gallons per minute coming in. And tank A has only four gallons leaving going to tank B. Now tank B, on the other hand, has four gallons coming in from tank A, one leaving to go to tank A, and three leaving to leave the system. So together, four gallons per minute leaving, which means our volumes are going to stay fixed. Now the thing that you got to remember, any type of mixture problem, is it is always right in or I should say the total rate of change is always going to be the rate in minus the rate out. So how fast is it coming in? How fast is it going out? Now what I mean by how fast is how what's the rate of change of salt? So if you have a flow rate of three gallons per minute and you have zero pounds per gallon coming in, you take the product of that to get the rate in. And um, notice actually for x1, what's coming in also is something from um, tank B. So let's let's write this out. So uh, dx1 dt is going to be, let's see what's coming in. You have three 
gallons per minute coming in of zero pounds per gallon. That's coming in right here. You also have something coming in right here, right? Which is one gallon per minute. So I'm going to add this one gallon per minute. And what is the concentration of what's coming in? Well, the concentration is going to be the amount of substance in there divided by its volume. So X2 over 50, and that's in pounds per gallon. So this is all the rate in, and now what's the rate out? What's leaving? So what's leaving, I'm going to do here in green, four gallons per minute at whatever concentration A is at any given time T. So that's minus four gallons per minute times its concentration, which is X1 divided by 50, the amount of salt in there divided by its volume. So this is rate in minus rate out. You can do the same thing with DX2 dt. Okay, how much is coming into it? Well, what's coming into tank B is actually in the green now. You have four gallons per minute times X1 over 50. That's the flow rate times the concentration. And then what's leaving is, and we'll do this in yellow again so that we're consistent, what's leaving tank B now is what's in yellow, which is one gallon per minute of the concentration of tank B. So one gallon per minute times X2 divided by 50 plus um, three gallons per minute, which is also times X2 over 50. So really, all this is, and I'll write this in blue, this right here is all 4 times x2 over 50, because it's got x2 over 50 in each case. This one up here, that's a 0, because it's 3 times 0. Um, so if we simplify all this, let me scroll down just a little bit, and I'll write down the equation. we got dx1 dt is equal to, we'll have x2 over 50, minus 4 times x1 over 50 and simplifying that I can cancel out uh, 2 out of the top and bottom so I'm left with 2 here and 25 down here which gives me uh, 2x1 Another type of model that involves a system of differential equations is one that's uh, commonly referred to as the predator-prey model. So as our example, keep in your mind that we, we're going to model the population of foxes and rabbits. So let's let X represent the number of foxes in a population, and let's let um, Y represent the number of rabbits in a population where they're both living in the same environment. So here are some of the assumptions that we would use to make the uh, to develop the model. First of all, if there were no rabbits at all, then the foxes would have no food, and so they would basically die out. They would decline at a rate rate proportional to their population due to starvation. So just like when we did population modeling and we said that the rate of change of a population was proportional to the number of or the size of the population, same idea here, they're going to decline at a rate that's proportional to the size of their population. So that means is dx dt is proportional, we'll use a as our constant proportionality, to the size of the population of foxes, which is x. But to indicate that it's declining, and I'm going to let A be a positive number then, we're going to put a minus sign out front. So if there were no rabbits, the population of foxes would behave like this. It would be an exponential decay problem. Um, dx dt is equal to negative ax. Now, if there are rabbits, then we're going to say that the growth of foxes, the number of foxes, is going to be proportional to how many times foxes and rabbits interact, because as soon as a fox comes across a rabbit, it's going to eat it. So that is food which provides the sustenance for the population to increase. So one way to model the number of interactions between foxes and rabbits would be take the number of foxes that there are, which is x, times the number of rabbits there are. So the more foxes, the more rabbits, the more interactions. This symbol right here means proportional to. So the number of interactions is proportional to, say, x times y. So the number of interactions would behave something like um, a coefficient of uh, proportionality, d, 
times xy. So it's really jointly proportional to those two. So your dx dt now is going to have this negative impacting factor, meaning that foxes tend to die off when there are no rabbits, but as much as there are rabbits in the population, then they will increase by the number of interactions they have, so plus this BXY. So the more Y is, the more interactions there are. The more X's there are, the more interactions there are, by, and you multiply that some constant of proportionality. So this gives you a differential equation which models the behavior of the foxes. Now, Y being dependent on T also, that is, it's going to change over time, the number of rabbits is, we, we want to consider what assumptions can we make about how the rabbits will um, change in terms of their population. So let's uh, assume an unlimited food supply for rabbits. So therefore, in an environment where there are no foxes, they would grow at a rate that's proportional to, to their population. So when there are no foxes, dy dt would be um, like ky. And instead of using a k, I'm going to use the letter d. So d is just the constant of proportionality. And now d is a positive number. Unlike a, which a being positive, the, well, I should say, um, not unlike a, but exactly like a, that's going to be a positive uh, coefficient. But whereas the foxes would decline over time without any rabbits, the rabbits would grow exponentially since there are no foxes to curb their population to eat them up as they grow, right? So, moving down here, let's talk about what happens whenever we do have foxes involved. Well, it's the same idea. It's going to be dependent on the number of inter interactions, but just as the number of interactions was positive, a good thing for foxes, the number of interactions between foxes and rabbits is bad for the rabbits. So, dy dt would have this constant, dy or this term right here, uh, modeling its growth, but subtracting away from that is going to be some constant of proportionality times the number of interactions between x and y. So what you end up with is a model that looks like this, dx dt is equal to, and I'm going to use this equation up here, negative ax plus bxy and dy dt is equal to dy minus cxy or slightly modified just factor out an x and a y from each equation you have dx dt equals I'm going to pull out an x oops let me undo that pull out an x and I'm left with um, in fact, I'm going to pull out minus x, so I end up with a, a, a minus by, and then I dy dt is equal to, I'm going to just pull out y, and I'm left with d minus cx. Okay, and of course we could assign some initial conditions. So this right here is famous enough to have a name, it's called the Latka Volterra Predator Prey Model, and for different values of a and b, which would be determined by physical actual characteristics in the physical model, um, you would end up being able to model the population of foxes and rabbits based on the assumptions that... Alright, so I've gone in my browser to uh, snipurl.com slash detool and under chapter 3 I want to look at the predator-prey model. Now what you'll notice is right here we have foxes given the equation that we derived um, dx dt or x prime is negative ax plus bxy so interactions are good for foxes bad for rabbits that's now the why there's a minus dy negative c x y and you've got some sliders here first ones I want you to notice we've got two graphs I'll talk a little bit about both of these over here on the left hand graph you are looking at a plot of x against y okay so each of these arrows is now a vector pointing in the direction of the derivative of d um, x dt dy dt meaning um, the actual gradient vector at that given point now without going into detail about that all I really want you to notice here is I can set where the initial conditions are this means we're starting in a system where we have 10 rabbits 
and 10 foxes. 10 rabbits, 10 foxes. Over here, I'm plotting both rabbits and foxes over time. So the horizontal axis on the second graph is time, and the height is both x and y. So the green curve would represent rabbits, and the blue curve represents foxes. Okay. Now, looking at the right-hand side, you see kind of an expected behavior that as the number of foxes increase at the start, then the number of rabbits is decreasing because there are more interactions because there's more foxes. They're going to be eating more of the rabbits and then you get to a certain number of foxes and then eventually that starts to decline because there's so few rabbits to sustain them. And so the number of foxes begins to decline and as the number of foxes decline then the rabbits are benefiting from fewer interactions between the number of foxes and rabbits and so they begin to climb and you see this oscillatory behavior whereas where the number of rabbits peaks and then shortly after that the number of foxes peak and then they both decline for a while until the rabbits peak again and then the foxes uh, also peak again right after that and over on the left hand side all we're looking at here is plotting the number of um, rabbits against the number sorry number of foxes horizontally against the number of rabbits and so this point right here is going to travel along this path over time and come back and repeat itself. Now if I adjust some different values, say I move A much higher, you see that the peak of the rabbits is much higher than that of the foxes. If I were to adjust some things like D, it makes a significant change on where the oscillation occurs for the number of foxes and rabbits. I can adjust B, which means it's the higher B is, the better it is for the foxes when there are interactions. Okay? The higher C is, the worse it is for the rabbits. So you can see the adjustments and what effect it has on there. Some of the questions on your homework will ask you to set specific values for these and also change the initial conditions. You notice under the circumstances, the guy right here looks like the rabbits are going to basically die out for a while and then begin to repopulate whenever the number of foxes reaches a certain low. All right, and that's all I want to show you. You have a chance to play with that tool on your own and use it to answer some questions in your homework.